Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. Uh, this is video 12a in our Structural Analysis 1 lecture series. And in this video, we will be continuing our look at shear and moment diagrams, uh, determining shear and moment diagrams and functions by methods of integration. In lecture 12, we explored uh, the integral relationships between shear and moment, and we looked at a, a, a one or two basic examples and discussed some of the uh, potential pitfalls and considerations you need to look at when determining or uh, shear and moment diagrams by integration. In this lecture, we'll just be continuing on with the shared moment diagrams by integration, working through a series of long-form examples of applying the uh, integral and derivative relationships of shear and moment uh, to the determination of shear and moment functions and their respective diagrams. All right, so our first example, or for our first example, I think we'll look at a cantilever beam. And let's do a cantilever beam. And uh, so it has a fixed support on this end and a free support out here. Now, uh, to make things interesting, I think I'll give a triangular loading. And in the previous lecture, or I guess a previous example lecture on in lecture uh, 11a, where we worked with the examples of the uh, of shared moment diagrams by uh, the method of sections, uh, we had a triangular load uh, increasing from zero to the maximum value at the right end. I think in this case, we'll make things a little interesting by doing the opposite case. So uh, let's go ahead and make this beam, oh, I don't know, maybe 18 feet long. So we'll make this 18 feet long. And let's say it has a maximum uh, load at the support of, oh, let's say 9 kips per foot. So we have a maximum peak load of 9 kips per foot, and the beam is 18 feet long, and we have a uniform or a uh, uniformly decreasing or a linear uh, line load. A linearly decreasing line load. That's what that's what I want to say. <laughs> anyway, so let's go ahead and label some points. I'm going to label point A and point B. And so all this is given, and we want to find our V and M functions, our shear and moment functions. Now, before we can apply integration, the first thing we're going to have to do is, or we have two, two, two orders of business first. First, we're going to have to get our reaction forces, and those will be useful when determining our... Uh, boundary conditions for our shear and moment functions and then we're going to need to get a uh, to get our uh, a function for our w as a function of x our distributed load w as a function of x although actually now that i'm thinking about it strictly speaking we don't need to directly find the reactions because as we discussed in the previous uh video lecture 12 we saw that we could use as boundary conditions for cantilevers we could use either the uh, reactions at the support, or we could use the knowledge that the shear and moment at the free end should be zero. So in fact, I think I'm gonna actually going to use, I think I might actually use those as my boundary conditions. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So if I do that, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to need is I'm first going to need my, uh, my W of X function, my load as a function of X. So find W as a function of X. And so, uh, well, this is going to be of the form this is a linear equation, so I can go back to algebra and say, okay, this has to be of the form y equals mx plus b. Uh, literally, I mean, this is literal algebra here. So, um, little algebra level stuff here, so not too bad. Our slope, rise over run, is simply going to be a uh, negative 9 over 18 or negative 1 half. We go down 9 over a course of 18, so we have a slope of negative 1 half. And so w is a function of x is negative one half x plus b and uh, i could put in zero uh nine and get my intercept that way or i could just say look this is clearly a y intercept so b is going to be nine nine kips per foot so therefore w as a function of x is equal to negative one half x plus nine and that is our load function, w as a function of x. Now, uh, furthermore, we could have a, um, so we could check the values at zero. So it's always useful to check your values on your load functions when you're creating from them from scratch. Uh, the w as the function of x at our at our, uh, so our leftmost support, we should have an x of, we'll have an x of zero. And therefore, when we put in zero, we get nine, which is exactly what we would expect. And at the far end of the beam, when we put 18 in for x, 
that becomes 18 times negative 1 half is negative 9 plus 9 is 0, which is exactly what we uh, would expect. So we have correctly derived our w as a function of x uh, function. So we now have a function for our load, and we can then uh, use this um, for for purposes of integration. Uh, we can't really integrate something unless we actually have a function to integrate. So uh, we need to get our w. So if, if you're applying uh, shear and moment diagrams by integration, you need to first have a function that you can actually integrate. So next, I want to uh, get, uh, get v as a function of x, shear as a function of x. So let's do that. And so I know that shear v as a function of x is equal, not to just to the integral, but the negative integral of w as a function of x, uh, dx, of course. And so that is then equal to the negative integral of negative 1 half x plus 9 uh, dx, or the integral of 9, uh, actually, uh, neg or that would be, let's just call that x over 2 minus 9. All right, let's get that out of the way. Okay, so x over 2 minus 9 uh, dx. And then let's get the integral of that, and let's see, that would be, oh, x squared over 4 minus 9x plus c1, where c1 is just some constant of integration. And now we'll see that I, uh, what I was talking about when I said we could just uh, ignore the, uh, we, we don't actually have to find the reactions on this one if we don't want to, because we do, because we can use either the, I mean, we ultimately need the reactions. We ultimately need the reactions to serve as boundary conditions for our integration. And we can use the left end or the right end. And on the left end, if we have the, uh, Reactions, we can put them on this side of the equation, but here we're just going to, we can we can also directly just use the knowledge that x equals 18 feet. The shear has to be equal to zero because this is a free end. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, work, apply that. I'm just gonna, you know, I just find it useful to write out just boundary condition. The shear at the V, the shear at x equals 18, well, this is going to be equal to simply zero. So I can then say zero equals 18 squared over four minus nine times 18 uh, plus C1 equals, uh, well, that's still, that's still equals zero. And I am gonna use my calculator for this one, I think. So let's see, 18 squared over four minus nine times 18 Okay, that is negative 81, 18 squared over 4 minus 9 times 18, that is negative 81. So that is negative 81 plus C1, therefore C1 is equal to positive 81. So therefore our shear as a function of x is simply equal to uh, let's see, we have uh, 81 is C1, and so therefore we just have x squared over 4 minus 9x min, or plus 81. And that is our shear as a function of x. All right, so we now have our shear function, and our next step is going to be to get our moment function. And to do that, I'm going to first erase this board here, or at least uh, this portion here. And that'll give us room to calculate our, uh, that, should, that should give us room to calculate our moment. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so again, what have we done so far? First, we determined our load, our W, our distributed load W as a function of X. Then we went and determined our uh, shear by integrating and applying a boundary condition where we knew that at the free end of the beam, the shear had to be equal to zero. And just a review from last time, from lecture 12, the uh, shear does have to be equal to zero at the free end of the beam, simply because there are no external forces uh, to balance an internal shear force. And if there's no external forces, there cannot be any, uh, any corresponding internal forces, other, otherwise we would have unbalanced forces and our beam would be in motion. And that would not be the best case.
we generally try to avoid having our beams fly through the air, um, unless you're studying aeronautical engineering, which is a, a different field entirely. <laughs> okay. So let's do m, let's get our moment now. So m as a function of x, moment as a function of x. So m as a function of x is going to be equal to the integral, not the negative integral, but just the integral of v of x dx. So let's see, in other words, that's the integral of x squared over four, minus 9x plus 8 dx, or sorry, 81 dx. Can't forget that one, that is important. So taking that integral, taking the integral of our shear function, I will get, let's see, x cubed over 12 minus 9 halves, x squared plus 81x, and then plus a c2, a second constant of integration. Now I need to, uh, to determine that, I need to apply another boundary condition, and I'm gonna use that same free end condition, where the boundary condition, I'm just gonna write out the boundary condition, I will say m, the moment, at x equals 18 feet, in other words, right at the end of the beam, must be zero. And again, I know that because it's a free end of the beam. So let's go ahead and apply this. Let's go ahead and apply this here. So uh, if just if this is m of x here, I can just set this equal to zero. Zero is then equal to 18 cubed over 12 minus 9 halves times 18 squared plus 81 times 18 plus c2. So I'm just going to put this whole mess here, everything except c2, into my calculator and see if that returns. So again, 18 cubed over 12 minus 9 halves uh, 18 squared plus 81 times 18. So I'm just going to throw that whole lot into my calculator. 18 cubed over 12 minus uh, 9 over 2 times 18 squared uh, plus 81 times 18. Okay, so 18 cubed over 12, yep, minus 9 half to 18 squared, plus 81 times 18, and I get 486 kit feet. So 486 uh, plus C2 equals zero. So therefore, C2 must be equal to negative 486. So I then get my moment as a function of x is equal to, well, let's see, we'll have... Uh, x cubed over 12 minus 9 halves uh, x squared uh, plus 81x minus 486. And that would be my moment as a function of x. So uh, through this, we can see our general process of determining shear and moment functions uh, by integration. Again, we start with our w of x function, which we had, which was right here, that negative one half x plus nine. And uh, sometimes that'll be given, or sometimes you'll need to derive that. Um, so, but not too bad necessarily. So we'll need to get that. And then um, we'll want to go and uh, integrate as with respect uh, with to x uh, once to get the shear, and we'll apply a boundary condition, which is just a, shear, a known shear at a certain point, to get to, to solve for the constant of integration c1. Then we'll integrate again to get our moment function and apply another boundary condition to get the moment as a function of x. All right, that'll do it for this example, and let's go ahead and look at another one. All right, now let's look at a different example. And this one's going to be a little more complex. Um, and in that, I'm going to add a, a, a few discontinuities to the system and see how that shapes our uh, shear and moment functions. So let's say we have a simply supported beam with an interesting loading kind of like this. So let's say you have something like this. And I'll divide this into a few sections. Let's just make each section four feet long like so, four feet, four feet, and four feet. 
And let's say on this first portion of the beam, there is a two kip per foot load. And then let's say there's a, um, let's see, that's eight kips altogether. So maybe a 10 kip point load here. So this is what the beam looks like. And I wanted to determine the full uh, shear and moment functions. Now, uh, picking up where it, or continuing on from some previous discussions we've had with shear and moment diagrams, you may recall that there are that one thing we need to be look on the lookout for when finding and creating shear and moment diagrams and functions is discontinuities. And I see uh, interior to this beam two locations where discontinuities are present. One of those is right here, and another is right here. At the location where at the x location where this uniform load ends. Uh, we have a change in the w as a function of x. We have a change in our load function. And a point load uh, interior to the beam also represents a discontinuity in our beam. So that's another location where we'll need to uh, uh, be cognizant, again, cognizant of discontinuity, or more precisely or specifically, we'll need that is a location where we will need to uh, divide our shear and moment functions into uh, different piecewise functions. So uh, this is going to look similar to some of our prior work. And what we're going to have is we're going to have a shear function, v as a function of x, where, where that uh, function is a parametric function with one expression from x equals 0 to 4 feet, this interval here, then another one from this interval, 4 feet to 8 feet, and then a third one from this interval, uh, x equals 8 feet to x equals 12 feet. And so we're going to need to apply that. Now, I purposely uh, made the loading relatively simple. The main purpose of this example here that I wanted to get at is to illustrate how you handle uh, solving by integration, shear and moment by integration, when you have uh, multiple discontinuities within a beam. OK, so our first step is going to be to find our reactions. So uh, relevant reactions, again, we could have a, we could easily have a uh, uh, X force, uh, a re extra horizontal reaction force at point A over here on the left hand side. But uh, because we have no horizontal load, we're not going to have a horizontal reaction there. So we'll just have a Y and then a BY. So uh, let's go ahead and get these then. So the summation of moments, so to get by, I'm going to do summation of moments about point A. Summation of moments about point A, counterclockwise positive. OK, so I first need to get the equivalent point load of the distributed load here. That's going to be 2 kips per foot times a length of 4 feet times a moment arm from point A of 2 feet. And that is going actually, and from point A, that should be a negative moment because it's clockwise. OK, then minus uh, the 10 kip force is going to, generate, going to generate a negative or clockwise moment about point A. So 10 kips times 8 feet. And then a BY will generate a positive moment about point A. BY, uh, and it will have a moment arm length of 12 feet. All right, so uh, let's see. So that is then uh, 2 times 4 is 8. So that is then negative 16. Uh, negative 16 kip feet. Does that sound right? 2 kips per foot times 4 feet. Yeah, OK, so relatively small moment from this portion. But since it's right next to A, that's not a, that's not a surprise. Uh, then minus 80 kip feet uh, plus BY times 12 feet. And if we solve for by, well, let's see, that is 96 altogether. So that should be 8, I believe. I think uh, that is 96. Uh, eight, 80 plus 16 is 96. Divided by 12 should be uh, should be uh, 8, yes. So 12, because 12, 12, 12 times 8, 80, 96. Yep, that is indeed 96. I can remember my basic multiplication tables. Or I can pretend to anyway. OK, so then by uh, should simply equal 8 kips. Now, doing the same thing, uh, let's go ahead and get the reaction at point B, or sorry, the reaction at point A, by a summation of moments about point uh, B. So summation of moments about point uh, B this time. Summation of moments about point B 
counterclockwise positive. Uh, let's see, I'll have a, a negative moment generated by AY, negative because clockwise rotation about B. So negative AY times the moment arm length of 12 B. Then uh, our two applied loads are going to generate positive moments. So plus uh, two kips per foot times a moment arm length of four feet, or sorry, times a uh, applied length, applied length or applied width of uh, four feet. And then from B, the moment arm length for the uh, equivalent point load of this distributed load is gonna be four feet, eight feet, 10 feet. So that's gonna have a 10 foot moment arm. Then I'll have my 10 kip force, my 10 kip point load. Uh, 10 kips, and then I'll have um, a moment arm length of four feet on that one. And all of that equals zero. So we'll have negative 12 AY. Okay, so this is two times four is eight, times 10 is 80, so plus 80. Uh, and then we'll have uh, 10 times four is 40, so plus 40, and that equals zero. So that'll come to 120. And so, so if I bring that over to the side, that's, or if I bring this, if I combine these two together, that's 120. Bring out to the other the side, it's negative 120. And so AY is just equal to 10 kips. AY is equal to 10 kips and BY is equal to 18 kips. And I, as good practice, I will go ahead and double check my, uh, my reactions because everything we do on this problem is going to be dependent on our reactions. So it would be it would be nice not to get those wrong at the very beginning. So I'm just gonna do a summation of forces in the vertical direction. And let's see, I have um, negative two kips per foot uh, times four feet minus 10 kips. And then my reactions, I'll have plus my BY of eight kips and my AY of 10 kips. Well, this 10 kips and this 10 kips will cancel out, and 2 times 4 is, is negative. Well, negative 2 times 4 is 8. Is ne oh my God. <laughs> negative 2 times 4 is negative 8, plus 8 cancels out. So indeed, that all does indeed reduce to 0, which is exactly what we would expect. So we do have the reactions. We now know that uh, BY is equal simply to 8 kips, and AY is equal to uh, 10 kips. So AY is equal to 10 kips and BY is equal to eight kips. All right, so we have our reactions. I'm gonna erase this and then we'll start by finding, we'll start working through our uh, load shear and mo actually, uh, let me think about this. Uh, no, I think we'll actually go ahead. I'll, I'll continue working on this. I'm just sort of plotting out ahead where we're gonna be. So the first thing I wanna do is, uh, the next step is gonna be to get a W as a function of X. And I'll get this as a piecewise function. And this one is going to be a piecewise function, but it's going to be um, an interesting one. Because the key thing to keep in mind is W as a function of X only applies to distributed loading. When, we're, when we have a load function, the point loads don't enter into that W as a function of X. They do have an effect on uh, serving as discontinuity point for the shears. But uh, point loads don't have, don't generally affect don't directly affect I should say the W as a function of x simply because you can't integrate a point load like that they do affect they do affect the boundary conditions as we'll see for shear but W as a function of x is going to be relatively simple so in other words W as a function of x is going to be like this uh, it is simply going to be t uh, two from x now I'm now uh, I'm using the same uh, I am going to be using the same uh, uh, sort of uh, sign convention I've been using previously, where x starts at zero at the left end and becomes more positive as you move to the right. And so it's going to be two kips per foot uh, when x is between zero feet and four feet, zero kips per foot uh, when x is between uh, four feet and eight feet and zero kips per foot when x is between 12 feet and 8 feet. 
Now, of course, mathematically, I could combine these two to get the bottom two states together into a single one, but uh, I didn't, uh, but we're gonna have shear that is a kind of function like that, that we're gonna, our shear and moment functions are going to break down like that into those different categories uh, because of the discontinuity produced by this point load. So I went ahead and just divided the uh, w as a function of x up like that as well. Okay, so maybe we can, uh, so now I think, hmm, how do I want to do this? I think the next step will be to, I'm gonna, I might work all the way through the shear. So to do that, I think I may actually uh, erase this here and leave myself this room to work. So we have our w as a function of x, and I think for, um, for the sake of uh, labeling, I'm gonna go ahead and put some labels on these sections. I'm gonna call these intervals one, two, and three. And so then I would have a corresponding w1, w2, and w3. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get uh, v2, or sorry, v1. v1 is a function of x, which would be, the, which is the distributed load in portion one as a function of x. So I have my w1 is just going to is which is uh, two kips per foot. So therefore v1 as a function of x is equal to the negative integral of w of x or w1 of x dx or the negative integral of uh, two dx or just negative two x uh, plus a constant of integration which I'll just call c1. Now, I need a boundary condition, and this is going to be the same kind of boundary condition we've applied several times already, which is at the left-hand side of the beam, the uh, reaction Ay is going to cause the shear to jump up a total of 10 units. So my boundary condition is that V at x equals 0 is going to be uh, 10 kips. And so if I set this equal to 0, put a 10 in for the shear and 0 in for x, I can get that C1 must be equal to 10 kips. So v1 as a function of x is simply negative 2x plus 10. Uh, so we have our first shear function. So maybe I'll start writing those over here. v as a function of x is equal to, uh, so that's going to be uh, negative 2x plus 10. On that same interval, x is less than eight feet, is less than, is greater than four feet. Now, um, for our, uh, now for our next interval, v2 of x, the integral is going to be very, very easy. It's just the, it's just the integral of zero. However, uh, the tricky part with this is that we're going to, we, don't, we need to figure out a boundary condition. And so let's look at this middle interval here. And this is actually the main reason I wanted to look at this problem is this middle interval. Because the prior boundary conditions we've looked at have in, always involved a beam end. We've either had a, uh, a beam end that we can just solve, for, that we can just use a solve for a reaction, or we've had a free end where the uh, shear and moment are zero. However, look at this interval here. Uh, look at this interval two here between four feet and eight feet, x equals four feet and x equals eight feet we have no supports here. So we can't just say, oh, the reaction is 10 kips and therefore the shear is 10 kips. We can't do that. Instead, we need to figure out some other way. And the way we can do that is to, is to look at this and say, okay, there is a, it is true that there is a discontinuity at uh, x equals four feet. And that is where this distributed load halts at that position. However, <clears throat> there is no, uh, there shouldn't really be a discontinuity in the shear. Uh, the by that I mean that the, like the the value just to the left of you know four feet should not be ten kips and just to the right of it should be twenty kips. That would be a sudden jump in shear. Uh, rather, uh, the slope of the shear curve will change or the shape of the shear curve will change, but the actual value of it will not change. So maybe it does something. It might do something like you know, go from a downward slope to a constant line or something, but it won't be, uh, but it should, but the actual value should remain constant between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. But in other words, the value coming from the left should equal the value coming from the right. The only, and that's because the only thing that can cause, that can cause sudden jumps in shear are point loads like this one. And so because I have, because at x equals four feet, I have no uh, actual point loads, just in, at the end of a distributed load, 
my uh, a boundary condition I can use is that uh, v1 uh, at x equals 4 feet should equal v2 at x equals 4 feet. The value from the left should equal the value from the right. So, and this is how you, ex this is fundamentally how you extend the idea of, um, of boundary conditions with shear and moment functions uh, to multiple, to beams with multiple discontinuities. Oftentimes with, you know, with, yes, with very simple beams, you might just have, you know, one discontinuity or no discontinuities, and you can, you can get by using just the uh, end reactions as your boundary conditions, but with more complex beams like this one, uh, suddenly you don't have, uh, suddenly you'll have intervals with, without a known uh, support boundary condition present. So you have to use the results from one section as the boundary conditions for the next section. Okay, so let's see how that look. Let's see what that looks like. So first of all, I need to get a uh, shear. I need to integrate to get my. I need to integrate to get my shear, and w two as a function of x is just going to be equal to zero. So therefore, v uh, two as a function of x is equal to the negative integral of uh, w two of x dx. And the integral of zero is just a constant, so I might just call that, I might just call that C2. Now, I do need a boundary condition for this. And so V1 at x equals 4, uh, x equals 4 feet, that is if I plug 4 feet into this equation here, well, let's see, I'll have uh, negative 2 times 4 is negative 80, uh, plus 10 is negative 70 kips. Negative 70 kips. Uh, does that sound right? Let's see. Uh, well, I apparently just cannot math. Never mind. That is not how math works. That seemed a bit high. Anyway, um, so uh, four feet times two is negative eight. That helps a bit more. I apparently just cannot math today. And so that is then, um, uh, well, uh, we have negative two times that is, so we have Oh, let's see, we're going to have then uh, two kips. So our boundary condition is that uh, V2 at X equals uh, eight or four feet is going to be equal to two kips. So therefore C2 is equal to two kips. So in other words, our V2 is just going to be equal to two kips. So, and this should be, actually this is written wrong, that should be from zero feet to four feet, sorry about that. And then it should be two kips from four feet to eight feet, like so. And then finally, and so let's just double check this again at x equals four feet, that is negative eight plus 10 is uh, two, so that's good. And then um, V3, uh, v3 as a function of x is equal to the uh, integral of w3 as a function of x dx, and that's just going to be the integral of uh, 0 is also just a constant. I might just call that c3. I might just call that c3, and then, um, let's see, so that's c3. And um, now I do need a boundary condition, and I might be tempted to say the shear from the left is equal to shear from the right at that at x equals eight feet at the boundary between them. However, that isn't exactly true. Rather, I can uh, I they are related, and they are related by this downward ten kip uh, force here. In other words, this ten kip force is going to cause a ten kip drop in the shear right at that location. So, in other words, I can say uh, v two. Um, or maybe I could say, I guess I'll write it this way, I think. I think this will make a little more sense. V3 at x equals 8 feet is equal to V2 at x equals 8 feet minus 10 kips. In other words, whatever the value is from the right coming from the left, we drop down 10 kips, and that's the value coming from the right. So, uh, and then uh, because we have a constant 2 kip value, um, in our second interval, that means that we have a uh, 2 minus 10, and that's just negative 8 kips. So that means our shear 
between uh, zero and, sorry, between eight feet and 12 feet is going to be negative eight kips. So we have a shear of negative eight kips between x equals um, uh, for uh, eight feet and 12 feet. So between x equals eight feet and x equals 12 feet, we have a shear of negative eight kips. Okay, and again, how we did each of these is we simply, uh, well, the one in the, le the, the leftmost integral, or leftmost interval, <laughs> interval one, we just said that there was a, uh, uh, we looked at the boundary condition just at the support, the reaction at the support, um, and then at the leftmost support, that pin support there. Then uh, for interval two and three, we simply looked at the, pr for interval two, we said that the shear coming from the left must equal the shear coming from the right, because there are no point forces there. Then at the boundary between two and three, we said the shear coming from the left will drop down 10 units because of this 10 kip force, and that produces a shear that is 10 kips lower in interval two. So we have our shear. Now let's go and get our moment. And to do that, I'm going to clear some room on the board. All right, finally, let's go and finish this up by getting our um, moments, our moment functions for each interval. Now, um, we're going to use a very similar approach that we've done previously. Uh, well, applying the for in, in terms of boundary conditions. So let's think about the boundary conditions that we can use here for a moment. So for boundary conditions, um, I do need some boundary conditions so that go from zone one to zone two to zone three. And so the boundary conditions, well, I can say that M, I do know that M at zero, X equals zero. Uh, let's just say it's uh, a little messed up there. Fix that. M at X equals zero should just be equal to zero because we have a pin support there. Uh, only a fixed support is capable of supporting moment at the end of a beam. Then I can also say that M at X equals four, or maybe like uh, I could say something like, well, I guess this would be an M M1 for the first moment function. Then because I don't have any point moments at either of these locations, the moment value should be continuous as we go across. The function itself won't be constant all the way along, but the actual value should not have any jumps as we go from uh, section one to section two and section two to section three. So I can say that M1 at X equals four uh, should be equal to M2 at X equals four. And then M2 at X equals eight uh, should be equal to M3 at X equals eight. In other words, we'll have different moment functions, but the actual values should be continuous all along the beam, uh, simply because we have no uh, we have no fixed supports, we have no couples, we have no nothing that will cause a sudden jump in the moment uh, applied at some location in the beam. Okay, or in the internal moment at some location in the beam. So uh, let's go ahead and get this then. M1 as a function of x, that is going to be the integral of. Oh, I guess I probably should label these. That would be v1, v2, and v3. So v1, v2, v3. So m1 as a function of x is equal to v1, or the integral of v1 as a function of x dx, which is then equal to the integral of negative 2x uh, plus 10 dx. Or that would just be equal to, let's see, negative uh, the integral of negative 2x is going to be just uh, negative x squared. And the interval of 10 is going to be uh, 10x. So plus 10x, and then maybe a constant, a constant of integration, which I might call c4, just to not uh, repeat my uh, variables for my, uh, for my constants of integration. And then I can apply that boundary condition. The boundary condition, m1 uh, at x equals 0 must equal zero. So if I put zero in for this and zero in for x, I can determine that C4 must equal to zero, must be equal to zero. And then I can also say that uh, M1 as a function of x, I can I can get this and simply write, I can get the full function now, because uh, I know the constant integration, I can just say this is equal to negative x squared plus 10x. So I can start writing out my moment function in full, my piecewise moment function. And that's going to be equal to, uh, let's see, negative x squared plus 10x. Uh, negative x squared plus 10x from x equals 0 to 4 feet. 0 feet to 4 feet. Uh, now I'm going to get my, uh, my second one, 
my second interval. And maybe I can squeeze this down here, actually. I'm going to try to squeeze all this on the rest of the board. So this will be fairly straightforward, hopefully. Uh, M2 as a function of x is going to be equal to the integral of v2 uh, as a function of x dx, which is just equal to the integral of 2. So that's equal to the integral of 2 dx, or just 2x plus a constant, which I'll call c5. So 2x plus c5. Uh, now, I need a boundary condition. And that boundary condition is that m1 at x equals 4 equals uh, m2 at x equals 4. So m1 at x equals 4, well, that's going to be equal to negative 4 squared plus 10 times 4, or negative 16 plus 40. So negative 16 plus 40, that should be 24. So that's our boundary condition. So maybe I won't be able to fit this all up without some more erasing. That's fine, we can just uh, do some erasing there. So our boundary condition is that m2 at x equals, uh, at x equals 4 must be equal to 24 kip feet. And again, I know this because there is no uh, couple or any kind of point moment at location at x equals 4 feet. So the moment from the left uh, has to be equal to the moment from the right. There should be no jump in the moment there. Uh, therefore, I can just apply this and say, okay, well, I know that m2 is 2x plus c5. m2 is a function of x equals 2x plus c5. Uh, then, so that's going to be 24 equals 2 times 4 plus c5 leading to that c5 is equal to, uh, let's see, that's 8, and minus, uh, 24 minus 8 is 16, so 16 kip feet. So then m2, as a function of x, is then equal to 2x plus 16. Okay, so 2x plus 16. Uh, in the interval 0, or not 0, but 4, uh, 4 feet is less than x is less than 8 feet. And before I erase this, I'll just go ahead and check my math. So let's see. So we took the, um, we had uh, 2x plus 10, or neg negative 2x plus 10. We took the integral, interval, uh, oh my god, goodness, the integral of that, integral of the interval, um, negative x squared plus 10x, so that's, yeah, that checks out, uh, 2x plus 10, yep, that checks out, um, plus 10x, we put in um, x equals 0 and c4 is 0, that sounds good. Okay, um, and then we got our boundary condition by setting m1 at x equals 4 uh, to the same thing at m2 as x equals 4, so negative 4 squared is, uh, so that would be negative 16. And uh, 40, so that would be 24, that's correct. So I know that, and then m2 at x equal, then just taking the interval, the integral of that, I get 2x plus a constant integration. And putting in um, 4 equals uh, 24 for x. So 24 equals 2 times 4, so 8. Yep, 16. So yes, that makes sense. m2 of x should be 2x plus 16. So I'm going to erase this work here and then finally solve for my a uh, final interval of between uh, 8 feet and 12 feet. All right, finally, let's get the uh, moment um, for our final interval here. So M3. And to do that, I'm going to need some boundary conditions, or just one boundary condition, actually. And the boundary condition I'm going to use is that, again, because there are no couples, point moments, etc., at x equals 8 feet, the moment from the left should equal the moment from the right. So. In other words, m2 at x equals 8 feet should be equal to m3 at x equals 8 feet. So if I go and do the integral of that, well, I'm not, I'm not putting the interval integral in yet, I should say. So uh, let's see here. Um, so uh, let's see, how can I do that? Um, so I can simply plug in uh, 2. Uh, times uh, 8, 2 times 8 feet, I'm just using my m2 over here from before, plus 16, 
and that should be equal to m3 at x equals 8 feet. So that's 16 plus 16, or just 32 feet equals m3 at x equals 8 feet. And I'll be able to use this as my boundary condition for my third moment interval here. So then uh, let's go ahead and apply this. So we have, so now it's, now it's pretty much cake. I can just say m3 uh, equals the integral of uh, v3, v3 of x dx. So that is then equal to the integral of negative 8. So the integral of negative 8 dx, or just that would then equal negative 8x plus a constant, maybe I'll call that c6, um, plus c6. Then I need to apply a boundary condition and say that at x equals 8, this has to be equal to 32. So 32 equals, um, let's see, that would be uh, negative 8, uh, negative 8 times 8, equals c6, uh, oh, plus c6, sorry about that, plus, plus c6. So that's negative 64, bring it over to the other side, that's 96. So c6 is equal to 96 kip feet. Or in other words, I, can ha I would have um, m3 is equal to, uh, that would be negative 8x, negative uh, 8x plus 96. And I can check this by saying, okay, what should the, uh, what should the moment function be at, uh, at x equals 12 feet at the far end? Remember, we're using a constant x value as we move across the beam, so we don't start over with a new x at every, at every interval. We use a constant x all the way across. And at x equals 12 feet, which would correspond to the far right uh, support of the beam, uh, we should have a moment of zero. And if I put in uh, 12 times 8, if I put in 12 for x here, I'll get 12 times negative 8, which is negative 96, plus 96. So m3 at uh, 12 is, in fact, 0, which is exactly what we should expect. So uh, that is then just negative 8x plus 96. On the interval, x is between 12 feet and 8 feet. And then this represents our complete shear and moment function. Our, our, and this is our w if we wanted that as well, if we wanted to report that as well. And then to create our shear and moment diagrams, this is simply a uh, this is simply a, a matter of plotting them, which wouldn't be too bad. So we're going to have a uh, actually, you know what? I think we'll, I might have a little fun. I might clear this board and let's actually plot these things out. So finally, I thought it might be nice to actually plot these and uh, actually create uh, some real shear and moment diagrams. Um, we've been finding all these functions. I think we should actually go ahead and create some diagrams. So from, you know, I might draw, I might just draw them directly below my uh, load diagram here, my free body diagram here. Like so. Okay, with some uh, with some projection lines just to indicate that the locations of my discontinuities are where I might have or I'll have changes in my shear and moment functions. And so, first of all, v. Uh, I'll get v my shear, and this is going to be in kips. So from negative from uh, x equals zero feet to four feet, I have a shear of negative two x plus ten. So that means at the uh, at the right or the left hand support here. Um, and let me use maybe a different color. Let's see what color would be good. Oh, maybe an orange. Maybe a nice orange. So we're going to start at 10 from where we have that upward force from our reaction. And we're going to decrease down to a value of 2. If I can manage to write a 0 properly. And we're going to drop down to 2. Then uh, we're going to have a constant value of 2 all the way across this zone. So 2. Then we're going to drop down a total of 10 units uh, to negative 8 here. And we'll remain at that constantly until at a constant value 
until the right-hand side of the beam, where our reaction on the right-hand side causes us to jump right back up to uh, zero. So there's that. Now let's get the one for, so, now, so this is our complete shear diagram. Finding some of these values and considering the boundary conditions was a little bit tricky, but the actual, bound, the actual plot itself wasn't too bad. So now let's go ahead and do the same thing for the moment diagram. And this would be in kip feet. Kip feet. And so then, let's see here. I know that on both points, but on both ends of the beam, I should be starting at zero. So I'm going to have a zero here and a zero here. Now, um, let's see. I know I'm going to uh, increase, let's see. So I should put my boundary values, that would be good. So at four, again, I'm at uh, 26, I believe it was. Uh, at x equals four here, so negative 16 plus 40. Yeah, so that's 26. So I'll be up here at 26, like this. And that will be a parabolic function, a concave down a parabolic function. And I know the value should, the slope should be decreasing as I go here because the shear is decreasing. And because moment is the integral of shear, shear is the derivative of moment. And so we're, that, we're, there at tw we're then there at uh, 26. Then uh, we're going to have a, line, a linear function that's going to increase from, uh, let's see, at x equals 8. Again, we're at, oh, let's see, at x equals 8, we're going to be at 32. So x equals 8, we're going to be at 32. So we're going to increase linearly, and I got that again by uh, just saying uh, 2 times 8 is 16, plus 16 is 32. So then we'll increase linearly to 32, and that would just be a linear function. And then uh, we will just decrease linearly according to the equation negative 8x plus uh, 96, uh, down uh, linearly to 0 at the end. Now, of course, if you wanted a more precise, uh, if you wanted a more accurate or precise uh, plot, you'd want to create this using some rulers and measuring uh, equipment on a nice sheet of engineering paper. But the, the point of this is just to illustrate the method, and uh, you're never going to be quite as precise when doing it on a big board like this. Anyway, I think that'll com conclude this example, so thank you. All right, finally, I'd like to just look at um, one more example. And in this example, it's going to be an interesting one. I want to show how to handle uh, changes in moment in the moment curve uh, caused by moments applied to a beam, a particular point moments applied to a beam. So for our third example, let's say we have something like this. And this is going to be a bit of an interesting beam. I can't off the top of my head think of anything that would do this uh, directly just like this, but I'm sure if I thought hard enough I could probably contrive an example, but this is more of a theoretical example uh, to illustrate a concept. So let's say we have something like this. Uh, let's say I have a simply supported beam, and ooh, let's make this interesting. Always a dangerous sentence. So let's say we have a one uh, clockwise couple of 100 kip feet here, and another clockwise couple, but this one in the opposite direction, a counterclockwise couple of 100 kip feet. Well, so this would technically be negative, uh, but I have them labeled in the opposite direction, so that's fine. And then let's put some lengths on this, some dimensions on this. And let's say this is, oh, I don't know, let's just make it 20 feet, 20 feet, and 20 feet. Because why not? This will be an interesting one. So the first thing you need to do is figure out if there are any reactions. And the reactions I could have would be an AY and a BY. Now, um, Doing a summation of forces in the vertical direction won't really help me, and uh, simply because there is no, um, uh, there are no bouncing vertical forces to determine any, any information. So let's just go and do a summation of moments about point A, and I would have a, a negative 100 kip foot moment from this one, and a positive 100 kip foot moment from the second couple here, and then. Um, then I would have plus 
uh, 60 feet times by, and that must equal zero because we're in static equilibrium. However, these two cancel out, so therefore I just have 60 by is zero, so therefore by is equal to zero. Then I could just do a summation of forces in the vertical direction, and that would uh, easily show that ay is equal to zero. So in other words, for this beam, this beam actually has no reaction forces. The, uh, the two moments are acting, the two, the two point moments are acting in opposition to each other. And so they will produce uh, internal forces, especially interior to the beam, but they will not actually cause any reaction forces because they, uh, w in the previous uh, lecture, we had an example where there was a single couple at the center of a beam. And to balance that, we needed a upward and downward reaction, creating a, a, a larger couple to balance them out, well, a larger spaced out couple, but same overall magnitude to balance that rotation out. But because these two couples are acting equal and opposite, we actually have no uh, necessary reaction forces on our beam supports. So uh, let's work through our equations. Well, W as a function of x across the entire beam is zero. There are no uh, distributed forces. Remember, W only refers to the distributed forces as a function of x. So we have none. Uh, then v as a function of x, and we could break this into intervals, but because we aren't, we aren't going, we, so we, uh, we could treat this as another piecewise function between uh, 0 and 20, 20 and 40, to, uh, 40 and 60. But for the sake of brevity, I'll just say that if you broke this into three, you just have uh, all three of those intervals would equal 0 for the, for the w of x. And the same thing for the v of x. And we'll see why here. Because the integral of w of x dx, actually the negative integral, don't want to forget that, w of x dx, that is equal to uh, just the negative integral of 0 uh, dx, which would just be equal to a c1. However, our boundary condition we can say for our shear is that um, because we have no reaction, or, a, or in other words, our ay and by are 0, our shear at both ends also has to be equal to 0. So a boundary condition we can use then is that v at x equals 0 is 0. And if we put in, uh, this is our vx, if we put in 0 for our shear uh, and 0 for x, we'll get that c1 is equal to 0. So I could then say that uh, v as a function of x is also just equal to 0. So for both our shear and our uh, load, we just have a single function. Uh, just, and we could break this up into three, uh, three uh, separate, um, three separate uh, piecewise, piecewise parameters, but uh, we don't need to do that uh, unless we really want to. Um, just for the sake of brevity, I'm not repeating this three times. I'm just saying, okay, it's going to be continuous throughout, so that's not going to be a problem. However, when we get to our moment, that is when I'll break it up into three pieces. So, um, in other words, you can think of this as equal to v1 of x equal v2 of x equal v3 of x, using the notation we used in the previous example. And so then, um, let's go ahead and get the m1 as a function of x. So m1 as a function of x would be equal to uh, the integral of v1 as a function of x dx, and that would also just be the integral of 0, so that would be maybe a c2. However, my boundary condition, one boundary condition I can use is that, um, let's see, that uh, m1, the moment at the left-hand side of the beam, should be 0. The moment at x equals 0 is 0. Therefore, I can conclude that the c2 is 0. So therefore, m1 at x, or m1 of x is just equal to 0. Um, we have no distributed load creating moment here. We have no reaction at the left-hand side. We have no moment until we get to the, at least within the first interval. However, um, let's look at M2. This is where it gets a little interesting. M2 as a function of x is equal to the integral of V2 as a function of x dx and is equal to V2 as a function of x dx. And then, let me see here, is equal to v2 as a function of x dx, 
which is just equal to the integral of zero, which is just then going to be uh, integral of zero dx is just a constant, so I might just call that C3. Now, I need a boundary condition. Now, uh, as we saw previously, we cannot use the, um, uh, the value from the left in this case will not equal the value from the right. It did it in the previous example because we didn't have this point moment here. However, in this case we do, and so this is going to change a, uh, is going to cause a jump in the moment. And remember, with the shear, uh, a upward jump in moment, in the shear, I'm sorry, an upward jump in load causes an upward jump in, um, in shear as well, or a, or a downward point load causes a downward drop in shear. However, with moment, it's the opposite. So a clockwise moment produces, or a clockwise or negative external moment produces a positive internal moment. So in other words, what I can say is that uh, a boundary condition I can use is that m2 at x equals 20 is equal to m1 at x equals 20. In other words, the value from the left, the value from the right is equal to the value from the left, except it's going to be plus 100. How do I know it was plus 100? Well, look here. Uh, this is a, uh, this here is a, um, is a negative moment. So that means it's going to cause a positive increase in the internal moment. So M1 is a function of X then, because we just have a, if we have that, um, so M1 is equal to, uh, and since m1 at x equals 20 is just 0, m2 at x equals 20 must be equal to 100. m2 at x equals 20 must be equal to 100, which means that uh, when I put that into my constant equation, m2 as a function of x must simply be equal to 100 kit feet. And I can do something similar for m3. I'll try to squeeze that in over here. m3 down here. So M3. Uh, I know that, uh, let's see, that M3 is equal to the integral of V3 as a function of x dx, which is equal to the integral of 0 dx, which is just going to be a constant, so be like, a, I guess I'd call that a C4, a constant 4. And for a boundary condition, I could use the endpoint, but I think that's a little too boring. So I'm going to say, okay, um, my boundary condition could be that M3 as a function of X, or not as a function of X, at a point, say X equals, uh, right at that boundary point, X equals 40 feet. M3 at X equals 40 feet is going to equal M2 at X equals 40 feet not plus, but minus, minus 100, minus 100 kip feet. Or in other words, since, our, since every point along M, uh, M2 is 100, that would just equal zero. Or in other words, M3 as a function of x, or as a just a simple function of x, is equal to zero. And how did I know that it was a that it was going to subtract 100 from the from the moment going across that gap, or going going across that discontinuity, or at the location of that point moment at x equals 40? I knew that because this is a positive or counterclockwise moment being applied to the exterior of the beam, so the interior moment must have the opposite reaction, which is a a, a drop. Um, so our moment going across that. Um, will be will be a uh, reduction of 100 kip feet in the internal moment. And that is what we would expect. So um, maybe I'll go ahead and actually plot all this out, see what this looks like. And to do that, I'm going to want to clear the board. All right, so we have our, we've uh, solved for our uh, shear and moment, and now we can go ahead and plot this out if we'd like. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the same kind of uh, projection lines down as I did in the previous example. And I'll have my V, um, and that would be in, maybe I'll just call that instead of V of X, I'll just say V in kips. And then I'll have M, and M will be in kip V. 
like so. And our uh, RV is going to be very simple. We have no distributed loads. We have no reactions. So our, uh, our shear is simply zero all the way across our beam. Simple enough. Then our moment is also pretty simple, except we're zero in this interval, the first 20 feet. Then a negative moment causes a positive jump of 100 kip feet for this middle interval. So we're up here at 100 kip feet. And then this negative moment, this negative exterior moment, causes a drop of 100. And maybe I can, I like to do that. And then that'll be back down to zero all the way to the end of the beam. And that is our shear and mump diagram for this function, uh, for this beam. Really my main reason for doing this example is I wanted to illustrate how we handle discontinuities caused by point moments. And the key thing to keep in mind, again, for point uh, loads, a downward point load will cause a decrease in the shear diagram, while a, uh, a clockwise, uh, a counterclockwise or positive moment will cause a uh, decrease in the moment diagram, while a clockwise or a negative moment will cause an increase in the moment diagram. So uh, generally you can, now both of those do obey the, the principle of exterior versus interior being opposite. The only reason that the uh, shear uh, corresponds directly where you have that an increase in our download, downward load causes a downward uh, drop in the shear diagram is because of the, um, the negative we have in the integral for our w of x dx. All right, so that's our third example, and I think that should do it. All right, that'll do it for today. In summary, in this video, we've looked at a few examples of finding shear and moment diagrams and functions uh, by the method of integration. We've applied the uh, integral relationships that we looked at in the previous lecture, as well as discussing some of the uh, subtleties in applying boundary conditions for uh, shear and moment. So the, the key thing to keep the key things to keep in mind are um, make sure you remember the integral relationships between w of x, v of x, and m of x. Paying uh, special attention to that that uh, tricky negative on the uh, shear integral function. Uh, then also uh, be aware of the uh, how we handle boundary conditions in. Uh, beams that have more than three, more than two intervals, where we need to use the uh, end conditions of one interval as the starting conditions of the other. So, and we've seen how a downward drop in uh, a downward point load uh, will result in a downward drop in the uh, shear diagram, and a counterclockwise or positive moment will result in a decrease in the internal uh, moment in a beam's moment diagram. All right, so that was a lot. Hopefully you got all this. Hopefully I didn't, uh, hopefully, uh, didn't leave y'all more confused than you started with, which is certainly possible. <laughs> um, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If not, I hope you found this a uh, little bit illuminating, a little bit uh, enjoyable by certain definitions of enjoyable. Uh, regardless, I hope to see y'all again soon. And as always, thank you.